Have you ever wondered where the television signal you are watching is coming from? Welcome to True North. Good evening and welcome to Maine Watch. Welcome to From the Vault, a celebration of 60 years of Maine public television. Since 1987, March 28th has been known as Edmund S. Muskie Day in the state of Maine. So what better program to commemorate that day than with this one from 1981. This is Take the Time. In this hour-long special, now Senator Angus King speaks with a retired former Secretary of State, Senator, Governor, Representative, about his days in politics and what he thinks of the political atmosphere at the time. This casual yet candid conversation takes place at Muskie's home in Kennegmungport with Angus King. Now these were the days before King entered elected office and was the host of several programs here on Maine Public, including Maine Watch, which he left in 1993 to make his successful run for Governor of Maine. So let's celebrate Edmund S. Muskie Day by going back to 1981 for Take the Time. The following program is a production of WCBB 10. On January 15, 1981, Edmund Muskie returned to Maine to the legislative chamber where his political career had begun 34 years earlier. The trip was an emotional farewell to public life for a man who had dominated Maine politics for a generation, a man who had stood close to the pinnacle of national power. Some months after his speech in Augusta, we visited with Muskie at his home in Kennebunkport. He reflected on his own political past and some of the current issues that will influence and largely shape our future. It was here in this room that I began my public life after winning my very first election. It is good of you to invite me back so that I can say goodbye to public life in this same room. In 1947, of course, things were much different, particularly for those few of us who were brave enough or crazy enough to call ourselves Democrats. Not that we were treated badly, we were usually allowed to speak before we were outvoted. <laughs> Muskie's jump from the legislature to the governor's office happened almost by accident. A few weeks before the filing deadline, he was still looking for other Democrats to make the run. Uh, the idea of being governor of Maine uh, was an idea that had occurred to me that I had found attractive before that time. It, the timing didn't seem right from a personal standpoint. From a political standpoint, it looked very good, as it turned out to be. And uh, I just felt that because of personal considerations, if we could persuade someone else to make the effort, someone else who uh, could be a good candidate, uh, like Clint Clausen. I mean, Clint Clausen subsequently did run for governor and was elected. We tried to persuade him to run that year. And he felt he couldn't for personal reasons. And uh, there was former Congressman Carl uh, uh, Moran, of Rockland, who was still, I think he was in his late 50s then, he was in the right age bracket, he was well known, tried to persuade him. And there were others that uh, we tried to persuade, but for one reason or another, they, they didn't see it as a good time, and uh, they didn't have the uh, optimism of youth that the rest of us at that time shared. And so eventually I, uh, I accepted uh, the notion with my wife's approval and uh, we wrote a little history. Did you, when you started in 54, did you personally think you were going to make it? Or was it, were you, were you, there was some talk that really what was being done was laying the groundwork for 56 and 
Frank uh, Coffin. That, that, that that's true. That before before I announced my decision uh, to run, that is the way we viewed it. We viewed it as a very good time to begin the process of rebuilding the party and laying the base for victory down the road. I don't think any of us truly believed at that point that we could win in 1954. Uh, our attitude about that, or at least mine, changed very rapidly because the impact of uh, these young fellows, you know, organizing and running without any evident hope of getting anywhere and doing so in an organized way and with enthusiasm and with the help of television, people could see that uh, you know, we weren't old Pauls, we were just a bunch of young guys, uh, reasonable common sense with some ideals about what we wanted to do. You mean and that, uh, people in Maine learned the Democrats didn't have horns. That's right, they learned we didn't have horns. They saw us on television. For many, many of them, it was the first time they ever saw a live Democrat. Uh, and so the whole thing sort of came together and you could feel the sense of excitement growing. And that was the same year, you remember, that young Bob Jones challenged Margaret Smith for the uh, Republican nomination for the United States Senate in the Republican primary. And that stirred up the political pot. Uh, she beat him handily, but in the process of doing so, helped stir up the pot and get political excitement to the surface. So then people began to look at the next fight. Well, the next fight looked like it might be the governorship, but this, you know, this young fellow from Waterville daring to challenge an incumbent Republican governor. And so the thing sort of built momentum. And you could feel that momentum uh, until toward the end, on election day, uh, I thought the, the chances were very good. About the time the polls closed, I said, well, now, let's be sensible, Muskie. You know this can't happen. And I remember the uh, television people uh, uh, came uh, up to Waterville. They wanted to spend the evening at the governor's mansion because they really thought he was going to win. And so they wanted me to, uh, uh, to uh, make two statements, one in the event I won and one in the event I lost. Well, maybe so they could recruit. So they could uh, use either one. And I said, no, I refuse to do that, but I'll give you one that you can use in either case. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I did. And one, only one uh, television man stayed up with us in our little hotel room in the Elmwood. What was his name? I hadn't better suggest one, because I think his name was Shepard. But in any case, he had confidence, and he stayed. And uh, so he got that on record, and he sold that all over the country. When, <laughs> when the first Democrat <laughs> when was elected. When the first Democrat was elected. You mentioned in your book that uh, you felt that Humphrey and Johnson never really figured out how to use television. Mm -hmm. Is there any danger of somebody who really knows how to use television but isn't necessarily a good leader uh, gaining power? Well, it's possible, of course. Uh, but I don't think that uh, television is necessarily uh, controllable by style. I think that uh, what is magic about television is that it can see through people or see into people, whoever they are, whatever their style, if there's enough exposure so that people can eventually, you know, see the real person. It's the next best thing to having them in your living room. That's right. It's the next best thing. And, uh, and uh, of course, there, I think the quiet style, uh, which is mine, at least when I'm on camera, Sometimes I'm not quite so quiet when I'm in the Senate chamber and having to influence uh, 100 Senate, 100 Bakke senators. But uh, the quiet style on television uh, is more comfortable, and I think it uh, does not get in the way of people seeing the person as much as the noisy style. So the quiet style is a good one. But what was good for me in, in, in connection with television was first the timing. 54 was the first year we had live television in Maine of any kind. Secondly, uh, we had to get used to television before uh, such uh, uh, complex arts as programming and uh, staging and you know all, all of the, the slick stuff, all, all the the slick stuff came. Out. I mean, we didn't have scripts, we didn't have teleprompters. Uh, they put you in front of a camera and you talked. 
Both his speech and our conversation focused on political parties. We move from there to presidential selection, the Reagan mandate, and the art of politics. Today in Maine, each party must listen to the other. And sometimes you must actually wait until the vote is counted before you know the result. Great difference from 34 years ago. I think both parties are healthier for it. Politics is more enjoyable, and the people are better served. This is the first legislature for some of you, I assume, as I look at the faces in this room. You are at the beginning of your political careers. When I began my own, I had no suspicion it would lead as far as it has, or that it would consume the years that it has. Perhaps some of you will seek other opportunities for service. I hope so. Perhaps some of you will have the great good fortune to gain attention for your ideas, for your skills and talents at the right time. Perhaps your neighbors will ask more of you. Opportunity will find you. New challenges will confront you. And after more than three decades, you might look back and wonder whatever happened to that law practice you had committed your heart and soul to so many years before. What about the, the, the relationship between television and political parties, that, te that political parties are obsolete because the candidate can go directly to the people and you don't need the party anymore? Well, television has had a lot to do with that. And there's no question but that uh, political party as a significant force in politics has diminished substantially since uh, that election in 1954, not only here in Maine but elsewhere, and television is a big part of that. Uh, in some regard, it is the, as the big uh, contributing factor to that result. I think that may overstate it somewhat. But because of television and other things, uh, candidates are independent of parties now. The uh, parties never really did raise much money from candidates, although not as much money was required either. Yeah, I think your first campaign was what, eighteen thousand? Eighteen thousand dollars for five uh, five races, mine and U.S. Senate and three congressional races. But the cost of uh, the cost of the campaigns now has added to the importance of television and radio and, uh, and also personal, uh, personal organizations. Well, do the parties have any function anymore? But the only function they now have is the uh, national convention or the state convention. And in Maine, the state convention has nothing to do with the selection of candidates. It, has, it is an important uh, political ritual every two years. It writes platforms and uh, gives candidates uh, a forum but at a very important... Oh, the party, I think, uh, in, in Maine has, uh, since 54, has acquired an importance in, uh, in keeping the party active between conventions. I think Maine may be a little different than other states in that respect. Uh, but the national convention, which selects the presidential candidate as a function, really only is uh, uh, in connection with the national convention. And uh, with the growth of, uh, of primaries, state primaries, and uh, the binding of delegates. You could uh, do it by mail. You could do it by mail. So that the, uh, and if that trend continues, the national convention is going to disappear. And if it does, uh, uh, national parties, I think, will disappear. Well, one of the in things. The, in, the, in, in, you know, in the form in which we've known them. One of the criticisms that was made of the process in 80 was that with all the bound delegates elected in January and February and March, 
by the time the convention came around in, in August, uh, the country and perhaps even the party had changed its mind, or at least may have wanted to change its mind, but it couldn't because the delegates were locked in. And uh, perhaps that's a, that's a problem with the process that we've developed. Well, the selection of, president, of a presidential nominee should be a rational process that takes into account all of the factors, including, I might suggest, the, the judgment of uh, party seniors, party officials, uh, you know, people who know these candidates. Well, that's, you know, parties used to act as a kind of filter. That's right. And if, and, and if you knew well, somebody were, face well, to well, face. Well, not so much a filter. They, they were more a representative process just as our governmental institutions are representative processes. They're not pure democracies. Laws are made not uh, you know, by the people. They're made by the people's representatives. And uh, the, the selection of presidents was done in the same fashion. But what I mean is it's, it's sort of reassuring to know that the candidates were known personally and intimately by some group of people. Exactly. There was somebody who, could, uh, who, could, who had an opinion that was valuable. That was based on something other than t TV. That's or... right. So that I think that uh, my own view is that uh, you know we ought to do away with the binding of delegates, and uh, so that the process would truly, you know, reach its climax at the national convention. Uh, the timing would be better. It would be closer to the time of uh, the general election itself. We should have the benefit of the senior, well, the representatives of the party and the Congress, governors, wherever. And I think that uh, as a prelude to that, uh, there ought to be uh, a real effort to rejuvenate party activity at the caucus level in every state. You know, caucuses didn't mean very much when I ran for governor, or 10 years before that, or mm -hmm. 20 years before that. I remember. Uh, you know, when we met in caucus in Waterville for the purpose of picking delegates to the state convention, often there wouldn't be more than half a, do a dozen of us who gathered for the caucus, and we'd just sit down and write 36 names or whatever it was, because nobody came, nobody was interested. And it wasn't that we were trying to control it, it's just that we had to you, were, you were there. <laughs> we were there, and we had to have X number of, of delegates from Waterville, so we chose them. Well, uh, things have changed since then. And I think uh, in Maine, it's a more viable and more alive process now than it was then. But I think in every state, uh, the party caucus is the basic unit of, uh, of party political activity ought to be made more meaningful, ought to be a more continuous process. But, but one of the things that, that you said, I, when you were starting out in 54 with Frank Coffin and the other leaders of the Democratic Party, that what seemed to be going on there were a lot of ideas, and there was a, the, the party got an image of one of ideas, and, and uh, uh, you've made speeches in the past that, that that's what politics is really all about. That's right. We, uh, I, I remember that uh, Frank, who was uh, party chairman, uh, sent out, but well, he was not party chairman at that time. He was, uh, he was selected the chairman of a pre-convention platform and as chairman of that committee, he sent out questionnaires all over the state uh, to all sorts of people, farmers, labor people, business people, big business, small business, and got an amazing return of ideas. And uh, it was the first time that had been done within the memory of living man or woman. <laughs> and uh, those ideas were taken into the convention and built into a platform uh, that attracted people. First, the unusual way in which it was put together. Secondly, because having been put together in that way, there were ideas that had some relevance to the problems as they perceived them. And so we got identified very early on as a party who was willing to take ideas from whatever source and, and try to make them work if we were elected. But isn't that one of the problems with the Democratic Party today? I mean, people say that it's out of ideas. The well, Democratic Party of, nationally well, hasn't... Maybe out of ideas, but it hasn't stopped trying to get them. Uh, the trouble is uh, we're, we're not, you know, having written the same formula to success so long that uh, we've not been as receptive to new ideas. 
In other words, we've written the old ideas. We haven't let them die. We've stayed committed to them, stayed committed to them too long in so many instances. We still recognize that ideas are important, but neither we nor, well, the Republican Party, of course, having been out of power so long, was more receptive to anything. <laughs> they had a lot of time to think. <laughs> they had a lot of time to think. But ideas still are at the heart of it, and ideas that, that come from the grassroots, uh, you know, because that's where the, the first uh, auguries of change are likely to come. If you've got a caucus organization active in both parties, close, you know, to the people who have problems, the farmers who can't get a decent price, uh, laborers, uh, you know, who are can't, uh, who aren't adequately represented, and uh, who live in, uh, uh, in, in, in a work environment dominated by management, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, if you've got, uh, if, you've, if your political organization is based at the local caucus level, there is a place for those ideas to begin to surface from the people who have problems. And, uh, and politicians are quick uh, to pick up ideas. Well, that, well one of the ironies, made. though, is of the present day and the sort of shift toward the Republican Party uh, uh, across the country is that a lot of the ideas of the Democrats seem to have worked, and the people who they've helped are now voting Republican, the blue-collar Republican, who's now in the middle class and uh, living in the suburbs. Yep. So their, their uh, perceived values have changed, but the change is part of it all. I, I, I uh, you know whether or not uh, the working man and woman has become uh, an economic royalist because uh, you know, his economic he's got condition is more comfortable than it was, say, in the 30s, is a question that uh, history will answer in the next uh, year or two or three or four or five. But I think that basically uh, the average American will understand the difference, and you already have that discussion. The difference between uh, uh, a national policy that benefits the one or two percent at the top disproportionately uh, and uh, it does not benefit the middle class, or, you know, whatever its new level of affluence. I mean, this administration's policies don't, uh, aren't, aren't tilted uh, to the laboring man. Uh, and They've done a pretty good job country. thus far of conveying that image. Well, while helping I'm not so sure they have. I'm not so sure they have. I don't have an independent poll to back up my instincts about it. But I do know that, that uh, on Labor Day this year, there was the first Labor Day parade in 13 years. And there were over, by the most conservative counts, 100,000 workers, and they weren't all air controllers. And uh, by more, uh, more, more optimistic estimates, as much as 200,000. So that uh, organized men and women in labor are beginning to see I'm beginning to see that this administration does not represent uh, their yeah. point of view on what our policies ought to be. Now, that isn't to say that, that the opposition to the, this administration's policies have as yet framed, you know, the, the, the programs of the future that, uh, that, they would, that they regard as relevant to the kind of country they want to build, the kind of world they want to build. They realize, as every American realizes now, that the last election has produced dramatic changes. You think the voters not realized all of them. No, that, well, that's, that they that's were the voting point. for those kind of changes? No, I'm sure they did not. I mean, no, electoral, no, no electoral mandate is that detailed. Uh, but everyone who wins an election, understandably, likes to convert the, the results to his own notions of what uh, policy ought to be. I did when I was elected governor, and we did a lot of things in the name of uh, my victory then that uh, we didn't necessarily talk about during the campaign. You, you, you know, you don't talk in that detail about platforms during the campaign. But, but what the country was looking for after last November's election was change. I mean, what their motivation uh, was the high price of energy, the high uh, inflation, the 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 frustration over the hostage crisis and the feeling that that uh, reflected a decline in American influence and power around the world. Those are the basic. Uh, there were other 
uh, frustrations, but those were the basic frustrations that led people to say, let's have change. No, whatever it is, change will be better than what we've got. And that's what they said. And now they're beginning to say to themselves uh, in, in the very words of your question, well, I didn't vote for that kind of a change. I didn't vote for that much change. I'm not sure I like this. I don't like that. And we're entering that period of that kind of questions. And you'll hear more about it. I mean, there are two, you know, uh, the, the, these very obvious observations I've always made about politics from that first election night in Waterville when I was elected governor the first time, that it is, uh, that it is the victor who is always regarded as the expert. Because I won that night. Uh, I, I, I suddenly became a new political expert, you know, one who knew how to win elections against hopeless odds. Actually, Governor Cross, whom I defeated, may have learned more lessons out of that campaign than I did. But because you win, you are the success, so you are the new seer, everybody turns to you for the new wisdom. Uh, second thing I've learned is, it doesn't matter how auspiciously uh, your, vic your victory uh, is perceived, or how auspicious your start in office, or how glittering your promises, or how enthusiastically they're welcomed. They'll be forgotten the next election day, so what, what have you unless done? the consequences of those new policies are seen as by the, by the electorate as being in their interest. And then they have to account for it. So the two important words out of three. There are three important words in, in politics. Victory, consequences, and accountability. The two most important ones are the last two. The consequences of what you do when you're elected with your victory, and the fact that you'll be held accountable for those consequences, good or bad. And if they turn out good, if you've picked the right policies, if you've been lucky enough to do that, fortunate enough to do that, and wise enough to do that, then the accounting will be another victory for you. But don't you think that there's a, uh, there's such, a, the, the society has become so complex and government so large on different levels that politicians today seem to be pretty adept at avoiding accountability, at shifting the blame, pointing the finger one, one place or another. Congress blames the president, the president blames Congress. And the uh, people blame everybody. And the people blame everybody. <laughs> no, I don't think it's that, uh, I don't, I, I mean, I nobody mean, knows I, I, who to hold no, responsible. But, well, but, but you see, the, you've made a statement that isn't borne out by facts. Uh, even before the last election, over 50% of the Senate was in its first term. So they don't... So they, you, so I mean, they are the, being the popular, Yeah, the popular image is that once you become a senator, you're a senator for 30 years or 24 years. Or Actually, that isn't so. And in the House, I think the proportion of first termers uh, was even higher. So there has been a constant flux and a constant change. And you look at how many presidents we've had. I mean, I've served in Washington with eight presidents. And, and I was in Washington 22 years. Now, that certainly is, is uh, you know, people don't focus on that. Sure, it's been one party, but even in that period, in that 22-year period, we've had Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, and Reagan, four Republican presidents. In that period, we've had Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, three Democratic presidents. And yet the picture you get, if, uh, most pe that most people have, is that you, you've had a totally Democratic government for all these, uh, all these years without any change. Well, uh, the fa there has not been as much change as there should have been in government policies, because the because Republicans tended to move in the direction of Democratic policies, in other words, moderate Republicans, and, uh, and the Democrats taken together, tended to hold to these old ideas about dealing with problems, even when demonstrably they didn't always work. And so you had sort of a, a, a static situation with respect to uh, the substance of government policy. Well, now that's being shaken up, and it's changing. No one really knows what the final shape will be. 
but it's going to be something different. I think it's a healthy shakeup. Not that I am glad my party lost, but nevertheless, you live with history as it happens. And as it happens, uh, the time had come when the American people wanted uh, uh, changes, and uh, those changes are now being made. They may not like the result, and they may move on and press for other changes. That's the nature of the process. As we moved inside, I asked some questions about the personal side of politics and an accident in the early 50s that left Muskie with a broken back. My first question was whether this had anything to do with his decision to run for governor. Well, I think my receptivity to public life uh, grew in that period, strangely. You know, it had been a, I'd been a struggling young lawyer, and we were married in 1948 and had two children in the first year and a half. And so, uh, you know, making a living was, it was a struggle, and uh, there was a temptation to get out of politics in order to, you know, get a law practice established and, and, uh, and build a better life for my family. But after you have an accident like that, you think to yourself, you know, in a, in a, no matter what plans you make, you know, the unexpected can disrupt those plans and, uh, and set you back, and you might just as well live life as it, uh, as it comes and do the things that you think you need to do and that appeal to you. And so I, I, be, I became less concerned, not in an irresponsible way, but less concerned with trying to manufacture a life of material progress for, for my family and more interested in making my life useful. Uh, I don't want to state that uh, uh, distorted, but uh, really I had a, a more positive perspective on, on uh, public life. Up until that point, I had thought of public life as, uh, as uh, something that involved maybe two or three terms in the in, in the main legislature, which I'd had, and then thereafter as an avocation, as national committee man and mm -hmm. you know, a sort of behind-the-scenes politician. Well, it changed. What about, uh, what about though, the, do you have any regrets in terms of your political career and, and the effect of, on family? I mean, Emory and Mitchell, for example, are spending every weekend in Maine, and that's got to be tough. Uh, well, we did the same thing, but I... Uh, my observation is that whatever your field, uh, if you're going to be successful, it is going to eat into family time unless you make a positive effort uh, to give your family a fair share of your time. And I found businessmen who uh, complain about the lack of time with family. Uh, sports figures, I mean, suppose I were a a big league football player, or even worse, bas baseball player, or basketball player. So much of the year taken uh, traveling away from home. You can't take your family with you. So I, uh, I, I think that uh, we've managed uh, to give a lot of time to family. This house is evidence of it. You know, this house, uh, I, we sold the other house and bought this house because uh, you know, how do how does five kids divide uh, one one cottage on a house lot? Now, Seventeen acres, you can find a way to split up among five kids, uh, and uh, we're we're changing it now and adding to it in order to make it a more attractive family house. And I found this summer with these rooms added, the house is more open, more livable. The kids are living here more; they come to see us more often. And uh, they enjoy it. Uh, the deck is great. We have meals together out there. We have breakfast together out there. They come in here and watch television, and it's easy to flow through these, uh, these rooms. And uh, they can get privacy here. That further porch, which is a quarter of a mile away, <laughs> is the greatest reading porch you ever saw. Because in, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun streams through the window right on that couch. You can stretch out there with a good book, get through about two chapters before you fall fast asleep. <laughs> with the breeze going through the windows, 
And you know, so there's plenty of room for privacy here, plenty of beds for everybody to stay overnight if they want to. There's the, the woods out here. They love to go down through the trails to the, to the, uh, uh, to the marsh, the salt marsh. Uh, this, and my youngest son, of course, only has to walk over a little ways to play golf, which is his uh, vocation. So it's just a great family place. And uh, our summer places have always been that. And I've always kept them, even though it's been an economic struggle, because I wanted my family to be in Maine all summer long. I wanted the people of Maine to understand that we, we were in Maine because we love Maine, because we love to be here. And the kids are growing up here and loved it. And, uh, and uh, so there, we, we don't play politics in this area. We haven't all these years. We just come up here and spend the summer. They see us at the grocery store. They see my wife ant antiquing. They see us on Main Street buying gasoline. And so we're not playing politics with them. We're just being Maine folks. And that's, this, that's what this house is. So it's in those ways that you manage to mix politics and private life. And I found it possible to do that. One quickly gets in his speech to the legislature, the Secretary of State stressed the strengths of our political system, but he also spoke of the challenges we yet face. Just how intimately connected our institutions have been resilient enough to allow for peaceful change. That is their genius. Your task is to make certain they continue to work and work well. So you have no shortage of problems to address. Your task is hitting the right solutions. One thing which came through during our conversation was Muskie's sense of perspective. For example, it appears here in his response to my question about the origin and long-range significance of the moral majority. Well, it's a mixture of things. That uh, is all... Uh, being wrapped together under one label. And there is a conservative mood to the country, in the country that's the product of economic conditions and frustration with government and government's growth and its uh, the demonstrations of government's ineffectiveness. I think that's part of it. People tend to get more conservative in harder times. Yes, especially when the harder times uh, take the form of this unprecedented inflation, which eats away at their income, and uh, they find themselves uh, stepping back two steps for every step they take forward, and it's, uh, it's very frustrating for people, as it is for all of us. Uh, what about but, the religious aspect of it, though? Does but, that give you uh, any pause? Well, what ha uh, the, the, that's the second part of this phenomenon, that, uh, that uh, a, lo a lot of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of these single issues, so-called, that have surfaced in this same time, almost coincidentally. I mean, the abortion issue, which surfaced to the Supreme Court decision of, well, what year was it now? Several years now. Uh, so things like the abortion issue, uh, gun control, which has been around and keeps cropping up with every uh, new uh, assassination, beginning with Jack Kennedy, then Bobby Kennedy, then Martin Luther King, and uh, then the attempts on the Pope and President Reagan. So that, that issue keeps cropping up. And, uh, it, it, and interestingly enough, with some of these single issues, the pros and the cons divide along conservative lines that also divide people on economic issues. And so you, they, they tend to get wrapped up together. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually they're not. But uh, whenever people believe in a cause, they look for allies wherever they can get them. I mean, co the word coalition and the concept of coalitions uh, uh, you know, concepts that have made the two-party system work in this country for, for 200 years. That if you can get enough people of different points of view to unite behind a single effort, you can win elections and control the government and hopefully, hopefully advance 
all of the separate interests of the people that you brought together. And this may be, we may be seeing the beginning of a new coalition here. How long it will last, uh, no one can tell. Um, Doesn't it bother you to have well, God's will invoked on the floor of the Senate? Politicians will invoke anything they can on the floor of the Senate. Uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, I mean, the rhetoric of these movements, you know, is forgotten with history. Uh, there have been other, you know, McCarthyism. When I, I mean, when the '54 election, when I was elected governor, it was the height of McCarthyism. People forget that now, mm -hmm. and that was surely fully as emotional a period, if not more so, than you know the moral majority emotionalism of, of today, and it's gone. Uh, People forget what it was all about, as a matter of fact, present time. I hear people making comparisons, but I think it was an entirely different set of issues at that time, although it did involve anti-communism, and that also is being resurrected in, with a similar virulence now as it, uh, as, as it found then. But it doesn't, in its present form, uh, question the patriotism of Americans. Uh, in the, in the way that not the uh, way that it did then the, the, the way that it did then so there's the, but it does that, question there's their, that difference it does question their morality though I mean a, if a politician doesn't go the right way he's the, the word yes. morality comes in that's a pretty heavy charge yeah but it's ambiguous enough so that you can throw it any way you want to uh, I, I don't really I, I, I really think that that when that effort is made, that the effect is more likely to be a backlash rather than effectiveness. In other words, the people who use that, that kind of uh, this, the negative campaign kind. Yeah, of I, I, I think it will, I think it will turn into a into a backlash more often than not. This An exaggerated exaggerated attacks of that kind at least in this part of the country, you know, evoke a sense of fairness that most people feel about each other. I don't think people really think that there's uh, that kind of moral, you know, morality, or you know, whatever you want to call it, involved in these differences of opinion over single issues or over uh, government policies. I, I, I don't really believe that, and I think that those who tr try to make that case too strongly uh, and irresponsibly will, will find that they're defeating themselves and their own purposes in the long run. Muskie's strong feeling for the practicality of politics comes through in these thoughts on the Reagan presidency. Oh, I think that uh, we're going through a, a period that's a mixture of things. Number one, a new president, uh, with an unusually long honeymoon, uh, who's personally easy to like. And uh, so I think that uh, the country wants him to succeed because he's likable. They want him to succeed for personal reasons as well as selfish reasons. And uh, they're inclined to give him a chance to make his ideas work, uh, even though they may have doubts about his ideas. So. Uh, People, I think, are giving the president a chance to succeed. Uh, it would be good for them if he succeeded. I mean, if right. he can really turn the economy around with these policies, obviously all of us would, would be better off. I'd like to see him succeed economically. I'd be better off, uh, however skeptical I am about the means that he has used. So I think there's that period, the period of giving a new president a honeymoon period and an unusually long one and with a you know a genuine liking for him uh, extending it and uh, intensifying it uh, and secondly his election uh, representing what he does in so many ways is causing a lot of Americans to rethink the ideas that they have accepted as sort of gospel and I shouldn't be using a religious word, should I? But it's, it's, it's sort of the f foundation of their own uh, 
uh, attitude toward politics, government, their own political philosophy. And uh, so I think people have been shocked into asking themselves, well, have I been wrong all these years? Is there a better way to do things? Is the president possibly right? So they're rethinking uh, a lot of their own views and values about politics and government and programs and, and, uh, and other people. So we're going through a period of, I think, national re-examination and re-evaluation of where we've been going, the directions we've been following, uh, the policies we've been supporting, and whether or not they're right and ought to be changed. And this period of uh, re-examination and re-evaluation, I think, will continue for some time. But then you begin to see, uh, I think, that uh, the economy doesn't respond uh, quite as uh, Mr. Reagan and his team have, have promised. It isn't responding that way. Uh, there will be explanations all, every time there's a failure of response. But uh, it's a dynamic process, and uh, uh, his, his people, his administration is going to have to be backing and filling on their economic policy. They're going to have to be backing and filling on their social policy. Uh, because the cons social consequences of, of uh, their economic and budget policy are, are going to be perceived as being harsher and creating more difficult problems for defenseless people uh, than Americans generally have believed to be the case. I mean, his safety net argument, I'm sure, reassured a lot of people. You know, that the thing, uh, you know, we could move to this new... Uh, economic policy without hurting anybody too badly. Well, if it becomes perceived that there are a lot of people being hurt much more badly than has been held out, and even harshly, and that it's creating problems that can't be dodged, and that those problems are going to begin to fall, you know, at the state level and the local level, or on people, you know, outside of government who are in a, in a, in a position really to help, families, you know, and whatnot, then they're going to begin to wonder, well, uh, it doesn't work quite as well as uh, Mr. Reagan thought it would, or said it would, or believed it would. So we're going to be going through a period when, I mean, we're going through a period now when people are testing the ideas that are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the base of this new administration. Then as they begin to form judgments about those ideas, then you're going to begin to see them go off in different directions, with different leaders going in each direction. And you're going to see leadership emerge. Everybody is uh, playing it cautious now. I think perhaps too much so. Uh, I think well, if for I'd a been while in, there. I think if I'd been in Congress, for example, uh, and I'm, I'm not you know, criticizing anybody who has been, but, but I, I think that it would have been well for anybody in Congress who has real doubts about these new policies uh, to have expressed those doubts, however they voted, to, ex to have expressed those doubts, gotten them on the record a little more clearly, so that if uh, those doubts are justified by events, that there is a record to, f to go to and to point to, you know, my, my, my own, when I've been asked, you know, well, well, what do you think about Reagan's economic policies? I say, well, I, I don't think they'll work. But as I've said just now, I hope they work. Because if they do, the country will be better off. And if they work, I'll give them credit for working. But I have my doubts. And this is why I have doubts. Well, isn't That's there... the view that, you know, that I, I would have tried to express, I think, if I'd been in the Senate. Well, earlier this year, the, the mood in the Congress Every, everybody was laying low. Uh, certainly the Democrats were. Everybody on, Nobody on, wanted on to. every side. Uh, moderate Republicans who normally would have been in doubt about uh, these policies have played low. You know, for some of the reasons I've tried to articulate here. Uh, number one, the country has said uh, it, it wanted a change. So you've got to give the change a chance to work. And you can't be just naysaying all along. Number two, it's possible that uh, the old policies were wrong, and these policies may work. And uh, so you ought to give them a chance to work. And 
It, it, it's that kind of a very frustrating period. If, you know, if you th think back to the Roosevelt honeymoon of, uh, of the 30s, I was a freshman in college when Roosevelt was elected. And uh, there were a lot of doubters about his new economics of that time, Keynesian economics. They weren't too loud. You know, he got, uh, he got his stuff through uh, uh, with almost no opposition. And uh, we followed that same philosophy increasingly ever since. After all the political talk, we toured the house, and Muskie's pride in the place, especially the recent renovations, was clear. He also kept coming back to the role of the house as a focus for his family. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear the cry of a new Muskie grandchild in the background of this sequence. What kind of repair was the house in when you got it? It was a disaster, <laughs> not structurally, but uh, although we did find quite a bit of rod in the sills this year when we built the foundation in order to winterize the house. But structurally, all you can see, these beams are in every room in the house. And they're, well, I suppose you'd call them two by eights, but they're more like two and a half by eights. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole house is like that. The sills are eight by eights. But you had to redo all the walls and that kind of thing. No, we didn't have to redo the walls. These walls, we, we had to paint them. That's what I mean. Yeah, these, these white uh, panels that you see were covered with National Geographic maps, every, every, every bit of them, <laughs> with, with tacks. And then when we took the maps down, these white panels were a horrible uh, blue color. So the first thing we did, the first week we owned the house, is to have all those panels painted white, and we brought in white rugs and this white wick of furniture, and that made the house livable. And we've been doing little things ever since. But this is still my favorite room, even though we, we've been sitting in the uh, new study, which is very comfortable. This, to me, represents uh, what a summer house was 70 years ago. Well, when you uh, decide you're ready to stop practicing law and traveling all over the world, is this going to be home? Oh, yeah, it's home now. We won't spend as much time here as we will in our Washington house. But this is where we feel at home. And the family is here. And we'll be here every summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And I think probably we'll, uh, next year we'll stay here through September, then come up for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, maybe for a little skiing in the wintertime, any time we like. When we, want, when we feel homesick and we want to feel at home and relax, this is where we'll come. The senator was full of stories about the house, from praise for the young contractor who had winterized and enlarged it, to the role of the weather vane in giving it its name. Well, ever since we bought the place in 1976, we had been uh, trying to think of an appropriate name for this 17 acres and this old house. And we've called it Old Farm for most of that time because the land used to be part of an old farm. The house wasn't, but the land was. But we were, none of us were ever happy about it. Uh, the first owner of this house was a Philadelphia family named Hines. So my oldest son thought we ought to name it Hines Quarters, which didn't <laughs> appeal to me at all. <laughs> so I was sitting here uh, after we finished the cupola, and I looked up and saw the reindeer against the trees. I said, that's the name. It's Deer Trees. One moment from the past holds a prominent spot on the study wall. That was on the podium out at Chicago. And so AP sent that picture, that size, up here because they wanted to take a picture of our kids looking at it. That's what ran, that's what ran the next day. And so naturally we had it framed and that's probably our most precious souvenir of that, uh, of that occasion. The tumultuous convention of 68 seemed far removed from the house in Kennebunkport, and the recent private citizen clearly enjoyed that such a place was now within his reach. 
And yet, as in his speech in Augusta, a strong sense of commitment to the political process permeated our conversation, a commitment that seemed to me undiminished by retirement from public life. The thing that I like best about politics is that it forces you to grow, to expand your view of the world, to expand your understanding of its problems, to develop your abilities to deal with the world in which you live, to form judgments, and to prepare yourself for ever-increasing responsibilities. I'm sure that opportunity for growth exists in other activities, in and out of public life. But I, for one, in politics, reached this point in my 66th year, after 34 years in public life, with no desire to retire. And that, I think, is a product of what involvement in politics, with all that means in terms of associating with like-minded and like-motivated people, and to the people whom you serve, that is what I get out of politics. And I commend it to anyone who wants a life of adventure, a life of potential achievement, broader than one's own selfish, selfish interests, an opportunity to build something for the future of this country and this world. And so I bless the life I've had, bless the Lord for giving it to me, and I thank all of you and those who preceded you who've made my life what it is. Thank you very, very much. What is fascinating to me about Ed Muskie is his stature, the projection of character which seems to set him apart from so many others who ply the political trade. It's impossible to define precisely what this peculiar combination of qualities is, his volatile temperament and imposing physical presence, his idealism joined with an acute sense of the practical, his long perspective on events, and his politicians' instinct to try to control them. Perhaps, though, it's none of these things, but something much more simple, something very rare. He is, I think, a man who knows himself and is thereby given the gift to lead. This program has been a copyrighted production of WCBB 10. Ed Muskie, Ed Muskie, this is quite plain. The man that we all want is the big man from Maine. Ed Muskie, Ed Muskie, we know you will do. The man that we all want in 72.